Good morning. good morning. This is a very good day because the Sekoulis are in their aisle in the front here as they're supposed to be. We welcome all of you, those of you who are new to our congregation and so many of you who are streaming with us during the summertime. It is the second Sunday of, of August and it is a beautiful day in New Canaan, Connecticut. It's the 10th Sunday after the Feast of the Pentecost and we're going to do just what we're supposed to do, which is to rise and sing joyful, joyful, we adore thee.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of a godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Let, let us say together Psalm 80. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim, in the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Stir up your strength and come to help us. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow, and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea, and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall, so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, Look down from heaven, behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. They burn it with fire like rubbish, at the rebuke of your countenance let them perish. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, the son of man you have made so strong for yourself. And so will we never turn away from you. Give us life that we may call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. 
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered the kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign and armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered, suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five and one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three, they will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it is going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. These words are spoken in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Grace to all of you who are here in the church and to all those of you joining us online and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to think for a moment about your spouse or perhaps if you're not married, you can think about your best friend, whoever it is with whom you are most comfortable in the world. I want you to ask yourself, when was the first time that you stopped being on your best behavior around this person? When was the first time that you wore your actual favorite t-shirt, the one with holes all over it because it's so old? Or when was the first time that you showed up without having uh, done your hair? Or perhaps um, uh, you haven't taken a shower after you worked out and you were just no longer worried about body odor around this person? 
Now, some of you are going to get to the back and you're going to say, I've never not been worried about body odor. I'm from New England. Where do you think? Yeah, we're, we're, anyway, I, 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 I respect that. But body odor or no body odor, when was the first time that you were on, you weren't, you weren't on your best behavior with this person? See, I think that when we're on our best behavior and all of that, uh, everything that that signifies, it's because we're not certain that person really loves us. When we're certain that somebody loves us really as we are, we can be fully ourselves with them. We don't need to put on any airs. It doesn't matter what we smell like. They're just going to love us. And believe it or not, the crazy passage which I just read from the Gospel of Luke is trying to say that God doesn't need you to be on your best behavior around him. It's okay if you wear your ratty t-shirt or if you come into his house a little smelly. Now it's hard to see how in the world that message could be contained in what I just read. The passage that I just read is one of the most difficult sayings of Jesus in any of the four Gospels. Father Peter has a great book. He brought it to the podcast, which we recorded in the balcony earlier this week. It's called The Hard Sayings of Jesus. And this one is definitely in there. The second half of this lesson, the one about family systems theory, I'm, I'm just going to say just a brief word about it, and then I'm going to put it to the side. This is the bit about Jesus having come to bring divisions rather than peace. I interpret this, and Father Peter and I discuss it at length on the podcast if you're more curious. Uh, I interpret this not as Jesus saying, I'm coming to bring division, as he literally says, but rather I have come to reveal the divisions which are already there. And this is because I read it side by side with a, with a prophecy given by an old man named Simeon in the temple to Jesus' mother Mary, whenever Jesus is a baby and they brought, Mary and Joseph had brought Jesus to the temple for what's known as his presentation. Uh, and at the presentation, Simeon, who has been waiting for the Messiah, who's been told by God that he would not die before the Messiah has come, he says famous words, famous because they become a canticle or a song sung in worship, when he sees Jesus, Lord, thou lettest now thy servant depart in peace. He's saying, actually, now I'm at peace. I've seen the Messiah. I can go to my death in peace. Following that, he tells Mary some things. It's as though Simeon pulls Mary aside whenever they've come to the temple. And he says that this child is destined for the rising and falling of many in Israel. And then he says that the secret thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And I think that's what's being fulfilled in this passage. It's what's being fulfilled in Jesus' life, and Jesus is recognizing it. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, but his presence reveals the secret thoughts of hearts. It's as though people get close to Jesus, and who they really are comes out. And who we really are is not always pretty. We are a people who are divided, right? Families are divided. Our nation is divided. The world is divided. It was divided then, divided now, and Jesus is saying, this is the way it is, folks, and it is very clear in my presence. And eventually, when Jesus died, he got churned up by all of those divisions. That's what I think he's after in that part of the passage. The first bit, though, those first two sentences about fire and baptism, that's what I'm particularly interested in this morning, though. To interpret them fully, I think that we have to look also at the beginning of Luke, this time to chapter 3. So here Jesus isn't a baby. Jesus is all grown up. Uh, and his cousin, John the Baptist, has been out in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So John is picking up on traditions of water baptism, baptizing people in water in order to call them to repent and call them to turn their lives around and to leave their life of sin. And he's been doing so saying that the Messiah is going to come and so you better be ready. So here's your baptism, repent, the Messiah is coming, etc. And something that John the Baptist says in each of the four Gospels in different ways is, I'm not the Messiah. He's very clear about that. Ostensibly because he was being confused for being the Messiah. He's an incredibly, uh, incredibly popular guy, as it were. Um, he says, I'm not the Messiah. There's someone coming after me. And here's the way that he says it in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. John answered the people, 
I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's another hard word. So John is saying, I baptize you with water. The Messiah is going to come and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This fire imagery that he's picking up is one of the three chief metaphors in the New Testament for God's judgment. The first of which is the famous sheep and goats. I always feel badly for the goats. My sister's a, a large animal vet and she specialized at the University of Tennessee in ruminants of which goats are one. Sheep are great. They're kind of stupid. They're actually stupid, my sister says. Uh, but goats, goats are fine. But the goats are always the bad guys in scripture. So you got sheep on one side, you got goats on the other. That's one image. The second image is people who are on God's right hand as opposed to God's left hand. For the lefties out there, I'm sorry. That includes my father who's streaming right now. Sorry to the lefties. The left hand is always the side of evil. The right hand is always the side of good. It's the second image. The third is fire. Okay, it's separating wheat from chaff. And then you burn the chaff because the chaff is useless. There's no nutritional value, you just burn it away. So you separate wheat from chaff, you throw it in a fire, poof, all gone. It's three biblical images for judgment. John is choosing the third of those and he's saying that's the baptism that the Messiah is going to baptize you all with, the Holy Spirit and fire. Ostensibly because some of you are gonna be all right and some of you are gonna get burnt to smithereens like the chaff. That was John the Baptist. Jesus, I think, is referring to this passage from Luke 3, to this prophecy about him, but in a way <laughs> with a twist that is just marvelous. Notice with John the Baptist, who's the baptizer and who's being baptized. So the Messiah is the baptizer, the one who's gonna baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire, and we are the ones who are being baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. But in our gospel lesson this morning, Jesus is the one who's being baptized, not us. Jesus is the one who's gonna get burned up, not us. So he starts with the fire line, right? I've come to bring fire to the world and how I wish it were already kindled. Then he says the baptism line. I have a baptism with which to be baptized and I'm under stress until it is completed. He's referring to his death. So this passage in the Gospel of Luke is taking place on the long journey to Jerusalem. Jesus at a certain point sets his face to Jerusalem towards the place where he knows he's going to die and he heads towards it. And on the way, he's performing miracles, he's teaching and so on. This is one of those uh, exchanges that happens while he's on the road to Jerusalem. So he's forecasting his death. Of course he's under stress. I would be too, wouldn't you, if you were going to die like that? If you were gonna die, period, of course he's under stress. But he's the one being baptized, not us. It's a reversal of John the Baptist's prophecy. Jesus is, as it were, both the baptizer and the baptized. His is the baptism with which to be baptized. And I think also, he's the one who's gonna get thrown into the fire. In the words of the, uh, the, the great Protestant theologian Karl Barth, Jesus on the cross in his death is electing God and elected man. He is God the judge and he is man the judged. And Jesus takes all of the heat, as it were. Takes it all. Suffers the penalty, pays the price, receives the sentence, and cancels it out. That's what happens on the cross. He just cancels it out. It is as though we can imagine we're in a courtroom and Jesus is the judge. The creeds say he's gonna come again to judge the living and the dead, right? Jesus is the judge. It's our turn to go up to the witness stand and Jesus says, well, I know I'm the judge. I'm also probably the prosecutor, but let's not get lost there. I'm the judge. 
I'll go to the witness stand instead. I'm just going to take care of it. You just sit right there. I got this. There's a baptism with which the world needs to be baptized. Guess what? My baptism. And I'm under stress until it's completed. That's what he's saying this morning. The only thing left for us to do is to enjoy our forgiveness. So that's a phrase which is associated um, with the spiritual writer Luke Rowland. He writes for Mockingbird Magazine, to which I was introduced by Jan Maines, our director of children's ministry. Uh, it's also been picked up by Calvary St. George's Parish in Manhattan. They've started to put it on signs, and they put the signs outside of their church. So you're like walking on the way to the cereal bar, and uh, you pass by the sign that says, enjoy your forgiveness. It's just fabulous, because that's all there is. He got baptized with this stuff so that we didn't have to. He got burned up so that we didn't have to. The only thing left is just to enjoy our forgiveness. That's it. There's a brilliant uh, piece by an Episcopal priest, the late Robert Ferrer Capon. Uh, Capon was a parish priest for 30 years in Port Jeff on Long Island and um, a brilliant spiritual writer. If you're a cook, I recommend his, um, his book, The Supper of the Lamb, which is a collection of recipes, and he gives you the recipe and then he explains the theology afterward. He's just, he's just totally brilliant, a delightful writer. Uh, but Luke Rowland, in an article that he wrote for Mockingbird where he's explaining the genesis of this phrase, uh, enjoy your forgiveness, um, refers to this particular passage from another of Capon's books about the parables, the parables of grace and judgment. And Capon here invites us to imagine judgment, to imagine we're in heaven before the pearly gates, etc., and we meet Jesus. And, well, you'll see. It's a whole lot better than my courtroom metaphor. But here goes, this from Capon. So what happens to the unjust? What happens to wrongdoers, the bad? Well, the unjust are all the forgiven sinners of the world who stupidly live by unfaith. They're the ones who are going to insist on showing up at the resurrection with all their record books, as if they were undergoing an IRS audit. The unjust are those who are going to try to talk Jesus into checking his bookkeeping against theirs. And do you know what Jesus is going to say to them? What, for example, he'll say to his heavenly host if, he, if someone comes to the resurrection with such a request. I think he'll just say, just forget it, Arthur. I suppose we have those books around here somewhere if you really want to take a look at them. And if you're really determined to stand in front of my great white throne and make a fool of yourself, I guess we can open them. Frankly, though, nobody up here pays much attention to them. What will happen will be that while you're busy reading and weeping over everything that's written in those books, I will go and open my other book, which I mention in Revelation chapter 20, the book of life. The book that has in it the names of everybody I ever drew to myself by dying and rising. And when I open that book, I'm going to read out to the whole universe every last word that's written there. And you know what that's going to be? It's just going to be Arthur. Nothing else. Just Arthur. None of your bad deeds because I erased them all. And none of your good deeds because I didn't count them. I just enjoyed them. So what I'll read out, Arthur, will just be Arthur real loud. And my father will smile and say, hey, Arthur, you're just the way I pictured you. And the universe will giggle and say, that's some Arthur you've got there. But me, I'll just wink at you and say, Arthur, come on up here and plunk yourself down by my great white throne and let you and me have a good long practice lap before this party gets so loud we can't even hear how much fun we're having. Friends, that sounds a whole lot better than being on your best behavior. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead in the life of the world to come. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We give you particular thanks for the marriage yesterday of Danielle Fugazi and Zach Least, son of Jeff and Lise Least, and for the 14th anniversary of the arrival of Father Peter as our rector today. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for Catherine, Emma, Cindy, Lorelai, Sharon, Marie, Courtney, Randy, Tom, Liz, Elizabeth, Norman, David, Wheezy, Teddy, Lee, Charles, Parker, Jovi, Rocco, Ellen, Anna, Allison, Miller, Raymond, Gail, Terry, Melissa, John, Scott, Dan, Jock, Janet, Mike, Michael, Lily, Len, Harry, Yvonne, Susan, Lee, Julia, William, Lori, and Anne. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, especially Morgan Boston, daughter of Susan and Lauren Boston, and Shirley Batory Weber, mother of Amy Reed, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our
and delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Uh, good morning again, and good morning to all those who came to church after I did my initial welcome, uh, which is one of the things I love about Episcopal churches. When you walk up the aisle, there's nobody here, but when you turn around for the gospel, they've come. It's very biblical in some way. And welcome to all of you who are streaming. And I just, to those of you who are streaming, I want to affirm uh, your life with us, and we always enjoy hearing from you and knowing that you're on the other side of our cameras. And I must say that I'm very, very struck by the power of the gospel to reach through the digital world and to touch people's hearts and to touch people's souls. I'm most grateful to all of you also who have come to church today on this beautiful uh, afternoon. I welcome many of you who are new to us and I notice that Anderson, you and your crew have changed pews. There's all kinds of things happening here. Uh, and also that Catherine Sekoulos was in the front pew, uh, just graduated uh, from school as she just told me, she has two BS's, which there's a whole host of jokes in that. But she just uh, finished uh, a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, and congratulations. It's been a lot of work, and we're huzzah for that. Uh, just a few notes about our life together, which is refreshments out under the arcade uh, after uh, we're done here, and also uh, the wonderful thing of, of having your kids come to church. Uh, we seek to make that as easy as possible for you. So be in touch with Jan. They can come and play while you can come and have a holy moment. Uh, and in just a moment, our maestro is going to play from the piano because um, the person who's going to sing for us and with us this morning is not feeling well. Uh, and to say that uh, if you have children, Ned's uh, children's choir is, is a really incredible place uh, to help raise up your children uh, to the glory of God. Uh, also, I noted this last week and to say that we're participating in what we do uh, oftentimes is closed for kids of Fairfield County. These are kids, as I, I mentioned, I think. Fairfield County is one of the most wealthy uh, uh, communities or uh, counties in the United States, and yet we have Bridgeport, which is one of the poorest cities in the United States, and many of the kids in our county uh, can't afford to have clothes. Uh, new clothes, and as school comes, these clothes, which are new clothes, put in a bin or gently used clothes that are clean, they put them in a store, uh, and the kids get to come shop before they go back to school, so I invite you to participate in that. And I also want to comment, uh, for those of you who are following on the stream, and for those of you who were here last week, you may remember that I spoke about, just before the Eucharist, about Morgan Boston, uh, and you heard her in the prayers for the deceased uh, this morning. Last Sunday, um, as I mentioned, Morgan was dying and she was, um, she was seeking a hand, a spiritual hand, a holy hand for her to cross into the other side. And she was speaking about a window. There was a window that she had to pass through uh, and that there was a spiritual family on the other side. There was a, there was a party on the other side of the window, and she was also asking questions about a lion. Uh, what was this lion doing there? And uh, she did pass through the window, and uh, she was 29 years old, and was beautiful on the inside and on the outside. And uh, it was the first time that I can recall in my nearly 30 years of, I've been out of the seminary for 30 years, that a congregation prayed somebody uh, on their path and pilgrimage to their death in that way. And uh, the Bostons are, are, are super grateful to all of you uh, who have had Morgan in your heart and helped her to pass through that window. The funeral that we had on Friday was most moving, and Father Justin preached a, a sermon that, uh, that one could listen to two or three times to get the, full, the fullness of what he had to say. 
uh, he was able to tell the story of Morgan's story in such a way that uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an affirmation that, that the spiritual world is the ultimate reality and the ultimate truth and the power of a faith life walking uh, into one's death because Morgan knew that she was going to die. It's an extraordinary thing. You can find this on the website. If you go to Watch Live, those of you who are streaming are already there. You can go to past services and catch Father Justin's sermon or watch the whole of the service. I also uh, would just like to note, it was in the prayers. Uh, I had asked Jill about this, and then I'd asked my, my wife Jennifer about this this morning, because I'm, I'm not great on math. They had, to, they had to create a math class to get me out of college. That's actually true. Uh, uh, math B, all the, no, all the math numbers, classes had numbers, and they had math A for people who couldn't add, and then they had to add math B, because I really couldn't add. But anyway, um, I just completed, this is the, I, my completing 14 years now at St. Mark's, and um, I just say how blessed I have been by all of you. Uh, it is shocking to me that, uh, that 14 years can go so quickly, a testament to time accelerating, I think, the older you get, but I think it's also a testimony to the congregation, uh, uh, to all of you who have been um, so holy hearted and so energized uh, in the gospel that uh, to be with you in the gospel walk uh, has been energizing for me too. So I'm super, uh, super is my new word, I'm super grateful uh, to all of you for my 14 years. And when my 15th year begins, I'm gonna be on vacation next week, uh, uh, so it's, which I'm looking forward to also. Holy Communion follows, and as you know, we're using Eucharistic Prayer C, uh, during this time, and all those, the liturgy is in your order of service, and we'll receive communion uh, up here at the altar, and as you all know, we are not practicing intinction, which is to put the host in the chalice. Now walk in love as Christ has loved us, and give himself an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
is right to give God thanks and praise. And God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your, at your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and had their being. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood, he reconciled us. By his wounds, we are healed. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel and Leah, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us on the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. <laughs> as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please turn in your order of service to the sending out of the lay Eucharistic minister. Today, Amanda is going to go see Nancy Means. Nancy has been a member of our communion for a very, very long time. And now we're going to give her the greatest gift, which is the gift that is greater than words. We're going to bring her Holy Communion. Let's do that together. Together we say, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body because we share one bread, one cup. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. and make disciples to live a deeper life in Christ, a more holy communion with one another, and a greater love for the world. Thanks be to God.